Hi, welcome uh, to Boston Common here in um, Google Cambridge. Uh, it's great to have you here. And uh, my name is Steve Vinter. Um, we're here for the second meeting of the Thought Leaders at Google Cambridge program. Uh, and this event is in partnership with Talks at Google. Um, and it's live streamed on YouTube, as well as being available to, um, to Googlers here locally. And so it's uh, great to have this uh, talk uh, go out over the, over the waves. Um, the point of this series is really to c get people in the area who uh, are thought leaders in industry and academia, and I think uh, today's uh, guests are a great example of that. Um, I'd like to thank Kara Miller, um, host of an executive editor of WGBH's Innovation Hub for coming back and, um, and leading today's discussion, and welcome Car uh, Dr. Carrie Emanuel from MIT, who's um, an atmospheric physicist or scientist uh, from, uh, for, as I said, from MIT and specializes in hurricane physics. So in some sense, you're a hurricane physicist as well. Is that, is that true? Like does that work? Like Good. Um, I think what's been really interesting about um, global um, weather change is uh, how unified the scientific community has been in speaking out about this. And um, in addition to Dr. Emanuel's research, he's been a big part of communicating with the general public with his um, book two years ago about what we know about climate change, which addresses both the scientific issues and also some of the political challenges of having this issue be understood and dealt with um, by our society. Um, I'd like to remind other Googlers here that there's a dory for questions that you'd like to um, have uh, Dr. Emanuel uh, answer. And let me turn it over to Kara. Thank you very much. Thank you. and. Um, just like last time, I really want this to be a conversation, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit with Carrie, uh, but then we want to open things up to you out in the audience and into the broader audience watching, so definitely be thinking of questions that you have. Um, there could be probably no better day than this because, you know, I woke up this morning, looked at uh, the New York Times online and saw that there was a huge new study about climate change that was... Uh, being published, sort of looking at Americans' perceptions of whether climate change is real and um, would they, you know, looking forward to the 2016 election, would they want to vote for somebody who wants to do something about it or who says, no, it's a hoax? And, and what you see is these huge numbers. And the, the sort of only thing I can compare it to in terms of movement is if you look at the numbers in support of gay marriage over, let's say, 20 years. Um, and you see sort of a massive shift. And the other thing you see with those numbers, as well as with these numbers, is that younger people and uh, older people are considerably different in, in terms of where they stand. So older people are still much more cautious about climate change, not sure that it's happening. Younger people are much more convinced uh, that it is happening and rank it in terms of this is something that's very important to me. We have to do something about it. Um, so against that backdrop, uh, we're here today, and I actually, Carrie, I'm wondering if that's the perception out in the world and things are starting to change and you really can see those numbers over 10, 20 years uh, and really the sort of massive public opinion shift. If you take us inside the world of climate scientists, where are they? How do they look out at this world and in at their own world in terms of what's happening? Well, it's very difficult to be a climate scientist today, look at all the evidence that we have in front of us and not be at least mildly alarmed. So what almost all of my colleagues and I see when we look at the evidence is, is risk, a rather substantial risk to uh, future generations. And that risk has uncertainty, as almost all risk does, almost by definition. And if you look out at the sort of the high tail of risk, that, that truly is alarming. And that's the picture that we have to deal with. So, and have you seen, has there in the last year or two been things that you would point to in terms of climate science moving that you think we should know about, but maybe th those intricacies don't get communicated to the general public? Well, it's, it, there's no sort of sudden turning point mm -hmm. here. We are gradually getting better and better at measuring the Earth. That's one improvement. So for example, over the last decade, we have been able to do something that's really a breakthrough, which is to measure the ocean below the surface much more accurately. It seems a little bit crazy, but 
a lot of scientists will tell you we know more about the surface of Mars than we do about our oceans, and it's simply a, a matter of ocean water being very difficult to measure. You can send a probe down, but you can't transmit by radio up through the water. So the answer turned out to be robotic floats, little baby submarines. You might think of them, but they're automated. They go down, they make measurements, they come back, they transmit the measurements by satellite. That's one example of a technological development that has allowed us to understand, for example, the heat content of the ocean and how it's changing much more accurately than we were able to do before. And what are climate models telling you? I mean, can you, can you take us forward 10, 20, 30, 40 years? Do, what, what's your sense of where we're headed? Well, let me preface my answer to that by saying that although climate models get a lot of press and attention, and in fact they are an important tool that we use, we were concerned about this problem long before there could be such a thing as climate models. So the Swedish uh, chemist, Svant Arrhenius, was worried about what would happen if we increased carbon dioxide and what it would do to the planet at the end of the 19th century, long before digital computers. And his estimate of what doubling carbon dioxide would do to the global mean surface temperature is well within the limits of what has been estimated largely on the basis of computer mm -hmm. models in the last few years. So models are big, complicated, uh, and there are a lot of approximations, somewhat offset by the fact that there are many of them around the world, so they're independent groups trying to do things. So what we see is an envelope um, of going forward, and in the next 100 years, assuming that nothing happens and we keep burning fossil fuels at the ever-increasing rate that we're doing it, we're looking at doubling the atmospheric CO2 content from pre-industrial values by mid-century and at least tripling it by the end of the century. By the time we get to tripling it, even the middle of that risk curve looks frightening to us. So does that move it mean that we're all moving to Canada? I mean, do we just, <laughs> is it, does it mean that there's going to be a massive relocation of the population northward? Well, there is, I think we have to think about two things, what you're talking about we would call adaptation. Mm -hmm. How are people going to adapt to this? And um, let's take a recent example that may or may have nothing to do with climate change is this big blizzard we had. Now, if you looked at the newspapers, some of the people that got really hard hit are down in situate. They had huge waves. Right, right and, on the ocean. And they have had before, and there's a lot of damage. And I would bet you that something will happen the next time. I don't think they're just going to rebuild there the same way. Either they won't rebuild there. There's even talk about the state buying that property, which has happened elsewhere. Or they'll build them on tall stilts, which is another way to do that. And I think this is what happens. New York got pounded by Sandy, and they're making a lot of changes for that. Now, as time goes on, if that's all that were to happen, we would gradually adapt, and the adaptation is local. It depends on where you are. Coastlines, one thing, inland agriculture, forests, all of that, get to be more and more expensive, and people become more and more wistful that we weren't doing more to mitigate the problem, that is to actually stop it from happening. Well, people talked about, after Sandy, building multi-billion dollar seawalls uh, in the New York area. It, do, do you anticipate that happening because they don't want another hurricane like Sandy? Well, uh, Michael Bloomberg, who was mm -hmm. the mayor at the time Sandy uh, hit, interesting enough, was already well engaged with the climate change problem when that happened. And the city has undertaken a very serious, comprehensive study of its options. Now, it, as a city, can't do too much globally to mitigate, but it can adapt. And so seawalls is one of the options they're looking at. There are other interesting ones. I don't know. It was a surprise to me to find out that 100 years ago, uh, Manhattan was a major exporter of oysters. And there were very special oysters that were delicious and widely sought after, which is why they basically went away, one of the reasons. Oyster beds that used to surround southern Manhattan were a big uh, uh, mitigating factor in storm surges, which is what happened in mm -hmm. Sandy. They actually slow it down. So one of the options New York is looking at is mm -hmm. reintroducing oyster beds. There are all kinds of proposals on the table, and it hasn't entirely been sorted out yet. So I want to zero in on this hurricane thing because, um, as Steve said, 
hurricanes are your thing. So talk a little bit about, let's talk a little bit about the past. What have we seen just up to now, if now is the stopping point, hmm. what have we actually seen in terms of hurricanes over the last several decades? Where have they gone? Have they become more numerous, stronger? What's happening? Well, um, I'll try to answer your question, but I have to tell you first that we don't do, and we haven't done a very good job measuring hurricanes historically. In the Atlantic, we think we have a reasonably good record going back to 1970, which isn't that long ago, and then it, the record starts to deteriorate. We have a reasonable understanding of landfalling, U.S. landfalling hurricanes and Caribbean hurricanes going back much further before that. But you have to understand that only about 11% of the world's tropical cyclones, which is the generic term for a hurricane, occur in the Atlantic, even though they get 99% of the press. Most of them occur in the Indian and Pacific Oceans, and we've done a perfectly terrible job and are still doing a terrible job measuring them. So with that as a preface, what we've seen in the Atlantic is a general increase in levels of activity from early in the last century to around the 1950s or so, and then a fairly steep decline from the 50s to the 1980s, and then a fairly steep rise then. Now, I'm not talking, of course, there's a lot of noise from year to year. For example, last year was very quiet in the Atlantic. But that's the sort of decadal trend, and we're trying to understand why that's so, and we we are quite sure that it has to do with some kind of climate signals, uh, including possibly global warming, but more, there's more going on than that. So explain to me how climate change does enter into hurricanes and enters into how strong they are and where they are. Interestingly enough, uh, hurricanes owe their existence to the fact that the Earth has a greenhouse effect. And, Broadly speaking, the greenhouse effect means that it's very hard for the oceans to lose heat by radiating it directly to space. And so they compensate for that by evaporating seawater. Seawater is always evaporating, which cools the ocean. And so you have to maintain an evaporative potential between the atmosphere and the ocean. It's that potential, interestingly enough, that drives hurricanes. And we realized back in the late 1980s that if you put more greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, this evaporative potential has to go up. It's just basic physics. You don't need big models for that. And so the, uh, the potential for hurricanes, in some sense, goes up. And that potential largely governs how intense they get, but doesn't tell you, oddly enough, very much about how frequent the storms are. So the, a lot more people have gotten, a lot more scientists have gotten interested in this issue since I first published a paper in the late 1980s drawing attention to the potential increase in hurricane activity owing to global warming. And the consensus now is that, that the frequency of the very high category events, which historically have been have completely dominated hurricane damage and mortality, the frequency of those events will probably go up. And there is evidence that it is going up in many parts of the world. But we don't know as much about the frequency of weak hurricanes, which dominate the numbers. So if you like to count, you know, that's what you're interested in doing. We don't know much about that. There are about 85 tropical cyclones around the world every year, and that number appears to be quite stable at the moment. Um, but the storms that we care about as a society, the really intense ones, the theory, models, and observations to some extent all suggest that those are going up rather substantially as we warm the planet. So if, um, if uh, Governor Cuomo from New York, if Governor Christie from New Jersey got you in a room and said, you know, we really need to talk to you, clearly uh, Hurricane Sandy was really expensive, very traumatic for people in our states, give us a sense. Is this something we should now be expecting every few years? What do we do about it? Is there anything to be done? Like, you're the expert. Help us figure out what the plan is here. So the, um, as far as we can make out from several different independent studies, given the climate of the last century, the 20th century, the history of hurricanes and models of hurricanes, Sandy was an event whose intensity in New York, or the surge magnitude of New York, you might have expected once every 700 years. In other words, it was a very rare kind of storm. Mm -hmm. And that's comforting. We're not likely to have another Sandy soon, but you know, it's the fact we've had one doesn't make 
uh, it any less probable to have one the next year. But we have also done studies where we look at uh, various different climate models and we make inferences about hurricane activity in them. And that suggests that the frequency you know, of that kind of event might go to more like every 200 years or so toward the end of the century. But I have to say that uh, all along, the U.S. is a bit of a special case here because the U.S. has a terrible, terrible hurricane problem even without climate change which is that we have in place, and this is well known in my field and, and in many fields, a lot of policies that very strongly subsidize and encourage people to build flimsy structures in dangerous places. And it's something you hardly see anywhere else in the world. And uh, if we don't conquer that problem, uh, which again exists independently of climate change, climate change will make that even worse. Is that problem being conquered at all? No. Uh, Congress tried a couple of years ago to address this in overhauling one big piece of that subsidy, which was the federal flood insurance program. So, you know, if you live in a floodplain, and that includes the coast, that covers storm surges, you can buy fairly inexpensive insurance to cover property. And it's not priced according to the risk. So it doesn't cost you that much less if you buy, if you get the insurance in some place, it's comparatively safe. So it underwrote it. And what Congress did was to pass a law mandating that the insurance premiums reflect the actual risk, which seems like no-brainer, right? Uh, that's what insurance should do. Guess what they just did last fall? They repealed it. There was so much howling from people who live on the coast, who typically are wealthier than the average American. Oh, my premium went up. It's now half as much as my car. Uh, what are we going to do? The skies fall, and they, they made such a racket that Congress basically repealed it. So my take is we're not going anywhere on this, hmm. not until we have some really colossal events that force the government's hand. Huh. Yeah. So let's look at, we talked a lot about the problem. Let's look at the other side uh, for a few minutes, potential solutions. Um, obviously, there is uh, the sort of political side of things, which we can get into later, but talk a little bit about, are there technological solutions? Are scientists working on solutions that you think have any sort of chance of really making headway on a, a pretty serious problem? I'm very optimistic on this front. I think mm -hmm. technology is more likely to produce results sooner than politics, at least in this country. <laughs> That's not saying a lot, what? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, there are everybody, I think everybody in this room probably is aware of the technology developments in wind and solar power. The solar cells have become more efficient, a lot lighter. I just had solar cells put on a uh, roof of a house we, we have in Maine, a summer house, and it's been wonderful. And maybe we can do about 40 or 50 percent of our electrical power needs. And that's about, unless there is a big breakthrough in storage of, of, of power, that's about the limit because of the intermittency of sunlight and wind. Uh, it's not a panacea. And so a lot of the effort is going to focus on base load. But I think there's some really, really interesting solutions. But there are a lot of political and social, cultural barriers to those. Uh, so one of them is just um, simply uh, capturing the CO2 from the atmosphere and burying it, putting it in solid or liquid form, and burying it in the earth. And uh, the Canadians and the US and some countries in Europe are experimenting with this. We know how to do it. It's a little bit too expensive now, but I think you know if we had a, carb a reasonable carbon tax in place, and we didn't have such a low price for petroleum as we do right at this moment, I think that would become much more attractive. So with natural gas and petroleum, there's not that much downside to burning the stuff, actually. If you can take the really dangerous things, the particulates and the carbon dioxide, out of it and bury it. So that's a promising piece of technology. The other is next generation nuclear fission which we also sort of know how to do, and it raises a specter in people's minds of bombs and things. The fact is, we shouldn't be operating 60s generation power plants. They're generating dangerous waste. There's a lot of risk of proliferation for, of, of the fuels, for, of the waste for weapons and so forth. But we do know how to build safe, passively safe, 
uh, much less expensive, far more efficient reactors based on thorium and using molten salt as the medium that carries the fuel. Um, we've actually known how to do that since the 1950s or so, and there are all kinds of groups, including here in Cambridge, that have sprouted out uh, up to, to try to take advantage of that. So that could really satisfy the baseload power in a very environmentally friendly way, produce far less toxic waste than 60s generation power plants so or I'll be, coal plants. I'll be the skeptic here. Okay. Um, you know, you talked about uh, having potentially a carbon tax to, to fund some initiatives. Yeah. I remember one time interviewing uh, two economists, one who'd served in the Clinton administration, one who'd served in the George W. Bush administration. You would suppose they would agree on, like, nothing. <laughs> they didn't agree on much. But one thing they did agree on was that we should have a carbon tax. And I, I, I said, wait, you both agree we should have a carbon tax? And they were like, yeah, most economists really do agree on that, wh wherever they are on the political spectrum. And I said, then you, do you think it could happen? And they're like, oh, no, it will never happen. So, so if, if we're relying on you know, money coming from a carbon tax to fund some of the potentially promising initiatives that you talked about, but that's never coming, does that concern you? Does that concern you that those things won't get off the ground? I mean, and then you sort of couple that with oil is dirt cheap, and then and and it's so hard to compete with that right now for any other alternative fuel. Well, the just to take your last point first. The the cheapness of oil is a very short term transient. I mean, we're not going to see it this cheap for a long time, maybe a few years. Optimistic, well, optimistically or pessimistically, depending on your point of view. But, yes, but uh, renewable, people yeah. in renewables would say every time this kind of thing comes, right, it sort of cleans out a whole bunch of startups that are trying to do something, and then they just get killed. And oh, that's then, right. You know. That's right. And in fact, there I read an editorial a couple of weeks ago very sensibly saying this is the time to do a carbon tax is when it's cheap. So my take on this, having read a lot of it, I'm not an economist, I'm not an expert, is that what the beauty of the carbon tax is it would accelerate a lot of this technology. I don't think its absence will mean this will never happen, on the other hand. So one of the things I argue when I have to argue with Congress, which occasionally I do about this, is you know this is going to happen. There's going to be carbon capture. There's going to be next generation fission. Really, the question is whether we develop this technology here and sell it abroad, or whether we're later forced to buy it from, say, the Chinese, who are developing these things, quite independently of what we decide to do. So that I think the technology will happen. Mm -hmm. But it could happen a lot sooner and perhaps more efficiently if we did have a mechanism that encouraged innovation. And that's really what the carbon tax, you know, uh, there was also earlier the, the cap and trade solution, which came out of a conservative think tank. So it is an area of, ec of economics where people from a broad, you know, political spectrum agree. Um, I want to take your questions in, in two minutes. So there are mi there's a microphone here and here. And then, as Steve said, you can also submit your questions, um, and they will be asked if you don't want to do it yourself or, or if you're watching remotely. So s get ready with your questions, and I'll turn to them in just one minute. Um, and uh, one last thing before we do that, uh, the, the solar and, and wind potential. It's interesting. It really depends on who you ask how much potential. Obviously, Germany has just gone sort of full-throated into solar. It's not a particularly sunny country, but that they went for it. Um, and uh, but but I've talked to people who said, you know, the fact that we have no good way to store solar and wind is a serious problem because the wind is not always blowing and the sun is not always shining, mm. and you are sort of never able to really wean yourself off that sort of central power plant burning coal or whatever they're burning to give you electricity. Mm. Well, I mean, the real probably <coughs> optimal solution is somewhere between those two extremes. And Germany is actually, a, in some ways, a good, in some ways, a bad example. I think they got up to 20 or 25% of their power, which is remarkable because, as you point out, Germany isn't a particularly sunny place. But that's a pretty hard limit. They're going to find it very hard to go beyond that. Now, to, they also, at the same time, after Fukushima, decided, I think, very unwisely, in my view, to decommission their nuclear power plants. The reason I think that's unwise is to compensate for the base load. They're building coal-fired power plants, which is what you don't want to do as fast as they can. Lots of them in Germany, 
And by the way, they're buying power from Switzerland and France who, guess what, generate it with nuclear reactors. So they're not really getting off nuclear, they're just putting it in someone else's backyard. Um, but any sort of today, looking at the technology today, any sensible power generation will have a lot of renewables in the mix. And largely it depends on where you are. If you're in the desert southwest, you can do an awful lot with solar. You know, if you're in Seattle, well, but uh, that's a different problem. No, the sun doesn't shine as much. Uh, if you're on the coast of Maine or Nantucket, um, you can generate a lot of wind power. But if you're down in Louisiana, not. So it depends on where you are, too. Question right here. So one of the nightmare scenarios that I read about with global climate change is the, the methane clathrates at the bottom of the ocean or the, the carbon that's sequestered in the tundra and worries about as the climate warms that these sources of carbon could, could re be released fairly rapidly and, and kind of dramatically change the, the whole chemistry. Um, what are your thoughts about, about these, that sort of nightmare scenario? That's an interesting question. Methane is molecule by molecule much more effective greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, but there's a lot less of it in the atmosphere. Um, but its lifetime in the atmosphere is a lot less than CO2. It's decades as opposed to millennia, basically. So as the uh, tundra begins to thaw, there is methane locked up in it, and it's released into the atmosphere, and that is a positive feedback on the system. Um, in the latest IPCC report, there was an attempt to sort of do an inventory of that, and it came up with it being not such a big problem quantitatively. But we do know, to take a sub somewhat broader view of your question, that when we study the uh, climate going back millions of years, particularly the last few hundred thousand years where we have good records from ice cores, we see uh, very rapid changes of climate that we don't understand. I mean, we sort of understand, for example, why there are ice ages. We understand that very well, actually. It has to do with the varying amounts of insulation from changes in the Earth's orbit, which are very predictable changes. But there are sudden jumps that we don't particularly understand. And this, the sort of thing that keeps us awake at night is the, you know, the Donald Rumsfeld unknown unknowns. It's that we know enough to know that we don't know a lot about the climate system and, and the possibility of a sudden flip to a different state uh, can't be ruled out because we see it in the paleoclimate records. Question over here. I've got to read from the question submitted <coughs> online. How significant is industrial released methane regarding climate change? Industrial released methane. That's a very interesting. So, first question. of all, what is industrial released methane? So, uh, just like CO2 is a byproduct of certain uh, mm -hmm. industrial processes, methane can okay. be. Okay. And uh, it's a little bit, it's, a, it's quantitatively a much smaller problem to deal with. Um, one of the sources that you can consider industrial, I suppose, is fracking. So methane is used a lot in fracking, and in principle, it doesn't have to get into the atmosphere if you're careful, but in practice, a lot of it does. So there's a big push in science, uh, in coordination with industry to try to reduce this problem. But I think other than the fracking, um, it is a problem. I mean, methane is going up uh, percentage-wise almost as fast as carbon dioxide. But quantitatively, so far, it's not the, the magnitude of the problem, the carbon. As, and the other side of it is that when you do stop, it goes away pretty quickly, unlike carbon dioxide. How important to you is it that uh, regular people who are not scientists, who are not politicians, who are not necessarily involved in this debate, understand what's going on. It, I mean, maybe it's not that important because they're not going to be the, pe the they're not the policy makers and they're not the people figuring out what's what's happening in the climate. To what extent are all of us sort of bystanders here? Should we know what's going on? Well, I mean, my view of that is that it's really great to have a in any field to have a small group of people who study this, who, who've tried their hardest to understand it, climate scientists. But on the other hand, it's unrealistic and perhaps not even a good thing to ask everybody to become an amateur climate scientist. Sometimes I think that's what people expect, we expect of them, that's not true at all. I think you need to know, understand two things well. One, that there is a risk and that my community is practically unanimous. I mean, if you asked uh, biologists 
how many of them believe that HIV causes AIDS? Maybe you'd get 97%, but I doubt it. I mean, 97% is a spectacular number. Um, you don't have to have all that much faith of it if you start focusing on the second thing, which I think people ought to know more about, is what the options are. And here I think not so much my profession as the engineering profession I haven't done the best job in conveying to people the whole spectrum of options. There's the faction that wants renewables. Great, because that will be part of the mix. There's obviously the faction who wants business as usual. They want to keep burning coal. Um, and there's this and that faction. But what we really need to look at is the whole range. And to see not just risk, but opportunity, OK? Quite apart from climate change, there are a lot of benefits that would accrue to getting, particularly getting off coal, which is estimated to result in something like 10,000 premature deaths in the United States every year. And would we tolerate that from any other energy source? If nuclear did that, every plant would be closed instantly. But we tolerate that because we're used to it. We ought to be phasing those out, going with renewables, and developing, as I say, next generation fission and other things so that we have a rational mix. And we probably ought to be doing that anyway. I think that's where the important debate, I'd like to change the axis of the debate from is climate change, man-made climate change occurring or not, which I think is fruitless at this point, although we still have to do a lot of work on it, to a different axis where we talk about solutions and argue in a constructive way about what those solutions should be. It's interesting because in the uh, most recent uh, Senate uh, race, Mitch McConnell, obviously running to be Senate Majority Leader, both he and his opponent on the Democratic side were strong, strong proponents of coal, despite the fact that fewer and fewer jobs in Kentucky are part of the coal industry. But it was absolutely crucial to both of them that they be seen as the uh, top champion of coal. Well, I think the long history of American politics, and probably politics in many other places, that we have representative democracy, and representatives are going to be arguing for their districts, right? And if you're a, from a coal district, you kind of have to do that. I sort of sympathize with them, but not the rest, we, the rest of us don't have to go along with that. And if it's just those two voices arguing, and then the Democratic person you're talking about was not representing the party on this, Right. Um, eventually their voices will be drowned out, and this happens over and over again in American politics. Question over here. Right. My question is basically, what can I do? Uh, I listen, you know, I guess I could do some Facebook activism, but all my friends already believe in climate change, so <laughs> point. Um, I, I vote, what, what can I as an individual, and what can the average person who, who agrees with you and who follows you do? That, that's, a, I think, an incredibly important question. And as an educator, I ask myself that day. Now, my students at MIT ask me that question quite a bit. Um, there are obviously some things you can do as a person try to try to be more conservation-minded. And that's not so important from the point of view of how much energy you actually save, even if you sum up over individuals. It's a little bit important. But to change the cultural thinking about climate. But the other thing. I think it's terribly important for young people, and you look young to me, although I'm blinded by light, so I can't see you very well, um, to, to young people uh, to, to really be more vocal about their concern about climate. And um, you know, even if the economics don't currently weigh in favor of doing anything about it, politicians tend to pay attention when they realize that a younger generation is really upset about it. I think this is how we, of, eventually, for example, got out of Vietnam. It wasn't from some geopolitical argument as much as the fact that young people made it very clear, finally, to their parents' generation that they were unhappy about the situation and wanted it to change. So I think being vocal in a sort of political stage, writing to your congressman, organizing marches, you know, that actually does make a difference uh, in the long run. That's my view. Another question. I have a similar question. Um, what can my employer do? And <laughs> specifically, Google has a tremendous amount of power, computational power, money in the bank, billions of people use this every day. We also operate under very strong constraints. We have to make money, and we have a mission to organize the world's information. Given these constraints, if I were to give you some portion of the power of Google and tell you to use it as best you could, what would you do? Oh, that's a really 
I'd, I'd probably have to ask you some more questions to answer that sensibly, but I'll have a shot at it. Um, but let me preface it by saying that MIT is another, it's not as big as Google, but a big organization is asking itself that question as a community. And I'm part of something called a, uh, there was a, a committee that was commissioned by the president of MIT, Raphael Reif, to start a climate conversation at MIT. And it's amazing how engaged our students are now in this issue. They're very, they ask a lot of questions like the fellow who spoke before you about what can they do. And one thing they're pushing MIT to do very hard right now is to clean up their own backyard. We're not a very em energy efficient campus at all. I work in something called the Green Building, named uh, not for the color or for, for it being environmentally sound, but after the donor. And it's as far from green as you can imagine. It's a huge energy hog. MIT doesn't even know, it turns out, very much about how much electricity individual buildings as opposed to the whole campus. Do. I think MIT should be a showcase for innovation in energy and buildings in particular. And uh, maybe there's a niche like that for Google, that when it contemplates building something, for example, it could, it could try to showcase, maybe it spends a little bit more, showcase energy efficient technology. Buildings use about a third of the power that we consume in this country. We talked before we sat down a little bit about this idea of divestment, which has been, there's been pressure at campuses around the country, uh, a lot of pressure at Harvard, to divest from uh, companies that burn a lot of fossil fuel. But as we were saying, that's, that's a tough one because, you know, where do you draw the line? What kinds of corporate activities are okay? Like let's say you manufacture products and you have people manufacturing them in Bangladesh under not that great circumstances. That's okay, but, you know, that's, it's a tough uh, way to sort of, you know, make that line. It, and we're probably going to stage a debate at MIT, uh, probably internal to MIT, but maybe streamed out on this divestment issue because it turns out to be much more complicated. And so we have big oil companies pouring money into research at MIT to do things like figure out how to bury carbon in the earth. Uh, do we want that to shut off? I don't think so. Um, so, uh, but on the other hand, there are some things you probably could divest from. It turns out a very small percentage of MIT's portfolio is wrapped up in fossil fuel companies, for example. But there's a flip side too, is we, instead of talking about divestment, we could also talk about investment. That is, MIT could strategically start a sort of sub-portfolio that deliberately tries to invest in energy innovation, green technology, and so forth. So we can also take the positive mm -hmm. side of that and maybe run with it a bit. Question here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think your book captures really well the complexity of the weather system. And I think over the last 50 years, we've done a great job of understanding really complex systems. I'd put the world economy and physiology of the human body in, that, in those categories. And I think what we've learned is as much as we know about them, we're still a long way away from having the effects that we want on them in a positive way and truly deeply understanding them. And your book comments about like chaos theory being a part of the challenge with weather. Uh, I'm just wondering if you had a magic wand and actually had a technological solution to greenhouse gases and you therefore weren't dependent on social change and all those effects and you also had the political will to actually apply that magic wand, I'm wondering whether we're prepared to, be, to have that kind of power and utilize it effectively given that changes have all sorts of uncertain effects that we have a very difficult time dealing with. That's, that's a fascinating issue. I wish I, I could give you a wise answer to that. I, I've always thought that wisdom is the, is the uh, quality of uh, understanding just the, the, the depths of your own ignorance on something. <laughs> and believe me, climate scientists have become very well acquainted with their ignorance on the subject. Um, your question is particularly pertinent to solutions that are on the table and have been proposed that are broadly called geoengineering in which we try to compensate for carbon dioxide by blocking sunlight. And we actually literally could start doing it both technologically and economically right now. We can pump sulfur into the stratosphere. We know how to do that. It's not even that expensive. But we don't want to do that because we're so familiar with our ignorance, if you will, of the system that we don't, 
you know, we can give a pretty good estimate of what will happen, but we wouldn't be too, too surprised if we were wrong. Uh, so there, there's all sorts of things. If I had a magic wand, I would, right now, I would implement a stiff carbon tax and let the market and science engineering kind of work it out because I think we're so close to being able to pull carbon back out of the atmosphere, which is not so dangerous because we're just reversing damage that we've already done. Question here. Uh, thank you for coming in. Um, I don't really care about the causation versus correlation factor. This is the only place I'm going to live in my lifetime. And you know, every generation that I can foresee is going to be on this planet. Um, so I'm wondering, though, and you talked a little bit about the carbon tax. Uh, I grew up in Canada. Even the price of gasoline is quite a bit higher than here. What's, and you're not an economist, but being around this, com this topic, what's the, your sense of how much we are subsidizing the, uh, our contributions to making this planet worse? Um, by artificially lowering energy costs in this country. I don't know if that makes, does that make sense? I, I think it makes a perfect sense. I mean, this is exactly the first thing you'd want to do even before you do carbon is stop subsidizing fossil fuels. We, uh, I understand that in the United States, our subsidies for fossil fuels are greater than our subsidies for renewables at the moment. And um, the conservatives say they don't like government subsidizing one industry over another, and yet we're doing this it's something that both sides of the aisle ought to be able to agree on at this point and stop. So, and what better time to stop subsidizing than when the price is already low as it is now? So absolutely, we should stop doing that. A carbon tax on top of that may be gracefully implemented over some period of time. And it doesn't actually even have to be a tax. It can be something, uh, in fact, I think this is act, might be proposed here in Massachusetts. Is a, I don't remember exactly what it's called, but you give the money back to people in, in some, so it's not a net revenue source. That's another way to do that, so you don't have to call it a tax. And in fact, it wouldn't be a tax, but just to, to, to stimulate innovation. I have high hopes that Massachusetts may become the first state in this country to have a carbon tax or some kind of fee on carbon. Hmm. Let's take these two questions. You want to just ask your question one right after the other, and then you can tackle both at the same time. Okay, I wanted to understand a little more what you were saying about hurricanes. Uh, you talked about the increased greenhouse gases increasing the atmospheric potential. And it sounds like you're saying that that's going to necessarily lead to increased hurricane activity. So you're saying that there'll be more, more hurricanes or there'll be you know, greater intensity, or, or how do we think about that? And then, yeah, let's get the second question in too. I have a very different question. Um, I, I have this whole fantasy I had last night of. <laughs> where the Koch brothers, who are now um, saying that they're going to you know, commit uh, about a billion dollars to the uh, presidential campaign, um, and are doing that largely to fight efforts to, um, to deal with global warming. Um, these guys give, you know, they, they built a building over there at MIT. Um, they did. They're giving money. One of them, or both of them are MIT grads. Um, I think and it's one of them. One of them is. Yeah. You know, my fantasy is that we, we bring them back to MIT and we, we say, okay, let's, let's sit down and have a discussion about this. Here are the researchers here in our, in our community who are doing what we think is the best work related to global warming and, um, and, and try to set them straight. Now, perhaps that's unrealistic, but I, I think my question is, really, do, is there, do we think there's really a disconnect in the scientific community, or disagreements over global warming? Do we think that argument, or, or disagreements over human causes of global warming, do we think that argument is settled now and there is merely a political disagreement? Do we need to bring people together to really understand what the causes are? Um, and you know, would educating the Koch brothers make a difference? Really, they're both very good questions. I'll try to take them in order. Um, the, the evaporative potential increase there's a speed limit on hurricanes. In a given atmosphere-ocean combination, um, the energetics of hurricanes puts a speed limit on them. If you put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you raise the evaporative potential and the speed limit goes up. Now, very few hurricanes get up to the speed limit. So, but what it means when we do a more detailed study of it is that indeed we see more of the high intensity events when we put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere or any other greenhouse gas. But what happens to the far more numerous but far less damaging weaker events, uh, there's not strong agreement on. 
The other thing I should say as an aside is there's a lot of agreement that the average hurricane will produce a lot more rain. That's very, very basic physics, and that's uh, of concern because a great deal of people are killed in freshwater floods. So to go on to the second question, I think I uh, learned a great deal from a conversation I had a few years ago with an ex-Republican congressman from South Carolina, Bob Inglis, who was a rare conservative Republican who did take climate change seriously, that what was stopping his colleagues from believing it was not because we scientists are necessarily all that poor at communication or that there haven't been efforts to reach these people, is that they were so afraid of the solutions, that there were going to be solutions they couldn't buy. The science really wasn't the issue, it turned out. And I thought that was a very profound sign. I've tried to go. Last year, I went to talk in a single meeting to the heads of the American Enterprise Institute, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, and the Heritage Foundation after promising myself, I think, for Lent that I wouldn't stop preaching to the converted and go into the heart of the territory. And it was a very interesting conversation. And I sort of steered them away from, you know, is this happening or is it not? I presented a little bit of evidence, as in my book. And I just tried to steer it to, you know, what about solutions to this? And I said, you know, we aren't having the kind of debate we should have about how we're going to solve this problem. You guys got to get into that debate. And I sort of got them excited about that. I tried to get them excited about that debate. And by the end of the conversation, they said, yeah, you know, and, and it sort of got lost in the background, but they must have been conscious of it at some levels. If they start to get involved in this, they, they've tacitly admitted that there's a problem to solve. I don't know if I want to do the Koch brothers because they're so wrapped up in the particular problem of fossil fuel, they're defending their own interests. Although one say, day I might. <laughs> I think David Koch, who is the main donor to MIT, I could be wrong about this. I'd have to Google it. But um, I think that David Koch doesn't, has said that he doesn't necessarily not believe in climate change, i.e. that he may believe in climate change. It's just that he has business interests that would be against a carbon tax. It's, it's not necessarily that he doesn't believe the science. Now, I'd have to double check that. But I think that may be true of him. So as you said, it's, it's a, it may be much more of a financial incentive rather than, you know, if we could only, you know, if, if there was only an explanation, like some form of explanation that would be effective. Last question right here. OK, this, this isn't my question, but I just wanted to mention that um, British Columbia already has a carbon tax. And it is, in fact, a revenue neutral carbon tax. I don't know quite what they do with the money. I think they use it to reduce other kinds of taxes. But in any case, uh, there is that example. I could certainly see uh, maybe some progressive state in the US adopting such a thing some, at some point, get, get a ball rolling. But anyway, my question actually is about conservation, which you haven't talked too much about. Uh, for example, my understanding is that Germany has invested a lot in passive solar housing, uh, much better you know, insulated housing, that kind of thing's probably been pretty important. I know as a homeowner, I don't do as much as I would if I had more economic incentive to do it, like a carbon tax, but I'm certainly aware of a bunch of stuff I could do in my own house. It just, my intuitive sort of understanding is that we, we have a huge way to go in, in just conservation alone, and that could potentially be a huge source of savings, but could you comment on that? Yeah. Conservation, it's the unsexy portion of, of you know. But it's something that climate. we're in control of, yeah. right? If you own right. a house or you, are contemplating buying a car or anything else, you're, you can control that to some extent. And I think you're absolutely right that you know, the average person is going to respond at some level to incentives and disincentives to do this sort of thing. And buildings are about a third of the power consumption, vehicles another third, industry is I think in very, very rough numbers. So if you can beat these down, you can make a big difference. And um, you know, we costed out at MIT, you know, what would it actually cost us to comply with the gold standard green rate in, in building a new building? And the funny thing is we surveyed our students and faculty about what they thought it would, the cost excess would be, and it ranged from 20 to 70 percent. The actual numbers are very close to zero. And that sort of surprised me, too. And it turns out that they're close to zero because if you have 
more insulation, more energy efficiency, you're generating solar. You don't need to buy as big a uh, ventilation system, for example. There, there are cost savings. And when you sum it all up, it's pretty close to zero. And I think when more people find out that they can do all this at very little cost to themselves, and of course over time, a big economic benefit, it's gonna happen in a more widespread way. Thank you for your wonderful questions. Thanks to Carrie Emanuel for letting us into the world of climate scientists for an hour. I'm sure he'll stay for a few minutes if you have other questions that didn't get answered. Thank you very much to Google and Steve and Carly for organizing. Thanks. Thank you.